Welcome everyone to our webinar. I see we have 108 people joining us. Um, thank you. Um, I wanna thank all the panelists for their time and thought on these issues. Thank you, Laurel, Richard, and Mary Jo. I wanna thank Rebecca Lieber, our moderator for her impactful work on environmental issues. Thank all of you for attending and thank you to all of the BLM employees with boots on the ground. We appreciate your work on our public lands. Also, we have Dave Gardner here from Studio 809. He's recording this for his fabulous Peak Environment podcast. In a couple of weeks, this will be available for you to stream. You can see here how we'll proceed to panelists' questions, to panelists' questions, and then we'll open it up to all of you. Please put your questions to the panelists in the Q&A, not the chat, and please use the chat to talk among yourselves. A little bit about PEER. We were founded in 1992. We have staff in six states with our headquarters outside of DC. We work with government employees, that's federal, state, and local employees. We support them in their work protecting the environment. We work on policy issues, legislative reform, we watchdog, and we represent whistleblowers. One tool that we've used over the years to hear from agencies are anonymous employee surveys. You're all here today because you care about the Bureau of Land Management. This is the largest public land management agency overseeing 245 million acres in 12 states. We wanted to bring together people to identify concrete steps that the Biden administration can take to strengthen the institutional capacity of BLM. It's worth noting that all the panelists are not necessarily in, in agreement with all of the recommendations presented, but I think there's plenty of overlap and agreement. Much of the BLM lands were historically populated by indigenous people. We wanna recognize and respect traditional stewards, and we wanna recognize the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. This conversation will be moderated by Rebecca Lieber. Rebecca is a journalist in Washington, DC, and has covered environmental and policy issues for many news outlets. She was honored with the SEAL Environmental Journalism Award, which celebrates her work documenting climate change impacts and solutions. She is currently housed at Mother Jones. Rebecca, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Um, it's so great to be here for this discussion. And um, thank you to Peer, especially for organizing this at such an um, important inflection point for BLM and public lands management in general. So um, I'll keep this short because we have a lot to get through today, but um, we're going to have a lively discussion with um, first Chandra and Laurel on um, trends and morale and opportunities for conservation for public lands, um, followed by hearing from experts and former BLM employees, uh, Mary Jo and Richard, um, using their wealth of expertise to talk about um, what's in store and recommendations for the Biden administration. Um, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So um, you'll be able to put that in the Q&A to um, ask the experts yourself. Um, and I guess with that, um, I will turn it back over to Chandra for her presentation. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so historically, BLM mailed out surveys to employees. However, unlike other agencies, BLM has removed most employee names and contact information from their websites. We think in response to increasing threats to employees. Also during the pandemic, many employees are working from home. So we decided to reach out by phone. I had a series of conversations with employees across the West in a variety of positions, some retired, some working. Although we had a small sample size, it's important to listen to the voices and experiences of those that have worked inside the agency. Our survey results show that over the last four years, BLM has become more plagued by staff shortages and high turnover. There are partisan decision makers in the highest ranks and the lowest. Their agendas are often contrary to the BLM mission of sustaining the health and diversity of public lands. It's going to take work to make structural changes to implement the Biden goals. 25% of US fossil fuel production comes from lands and waters managed directly by the federal government. The Biden administration in its first week issued an executive order to tackle the climate crisis. What can we do to address climate change? The single most cost-effective way to mitigate climate change is to protect land and water habitats. 
BLM will look at new proposals like 30 by 30, which will preserve open space. And what about not just freezing oil and gas leasing, but stopping new drilling? How can BLM weave these goals into its mission? Uh, okay, some context and recommendations. Morale is low. In the 2019 OPM Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, when asked about the effectiveness of senior leadership in the US government, BLM employees ranked their senior leadership near the bottom of all the agencies, 375th out of 413. Employees ranked BLM in the bottom third of best places to work in the federal government. We received similar feedback in our small survey. Also, more than three quarters of the employees that we surveyed do not believe that BLM has the staffing or resources to accomplish its mission. This chart shows the difference between staffing levels at the Forest Service, the Park Service, and BLM. We compared the number of employees each agency has in relation to the number of acres that they cover. You can see that at BLM, for every 31,499 acres, there's only one employee. What a difference. Yes, each agency has a different mission, but the feeling among BLM employees is that the agency has never been a priority under any administration. The number one issues that employees discussed with me is the fact that BLM is understaffed. These are staffing levels in different states, again, based on employees per acre. Look at the difference between the BLM numbers in Oregon and Nevada. I heard about the historical reasons for these differences, but this is the time to consider structural change. An employee asked me to specific, specifically look up these numbers in Utah. He felt the discrepancy. Arches National Park is managed by the Park Service and is just five miles down the road from the BLM Moab field office. Yet look at the amount of land that BLM staff is covering compared to the Park Service. Three million people a year visit this field office. Next slide. An employee told me that BLM field managers ignore the Subarus in the parking lot. Instead, they only respond to the customers, that's the ranchers, and the clients, that's the oil and gas companies. The agency can easily increase stakeholder participation. Local advocates, tribal nations, outdoor recreation businesses, they all want public lands protected. The agency can strengthen government to government consultation in recognition of tribal sovereignty. I heard from many, many, that one of the most devastating legacies of the Trump administration may be the changes to how BLM implements NEPA. This law is often the only way that the public has input or even knows when decisions are being made. Shortened deadlines and the increase in the use of categorical exclusions are squeezing out the public. This is my most important slide and my last, moving forward. You can see the groups of recommendations, but let me give you some of the specifics from employees. Hire 5,000 more people, including GS5 through sevens, more rangers to manage recreation and interact with the public, more maintenance and sanitation crews, hire specialists, engineers, and 50% more field staff. A conservation mandate should come from the top down it needs to be stated explicitly as part of the mission at each field office. Restart the BLM state science committees and ensure integrity in science. Set a fair market grazing fee and reevaluate whether it makes sense to graze in hot deserts. And what about a listening tour for the new director? Visit each field office and hear the expertise and the thoughts of the employees. I heard much more. Our report will be available on our website next week and I will email each of you a link. Um, I hope that you all have the chance to read it and pass it along. Thank you. And now, Laurel Williams. Great, thanks Chandra and glad to be here with folks today. Um, again, my name is Laurel Williams and I am a program officer for the Pew Charitable Trust US Public Lands and Rivers Conservation Program. Um, HU is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to improving public policy, informing the public, and invigorating civic life. So today I'm going to talk about trends within the Bureau of Land Management's Resource Management Plan revisions under the last presidential administration, and then I'm going to talk about conservation opportunities for the new administration. 
So first, let's take a look at the BLM's resource management plan revisions that advanced during the Trump presidency. Um, Pew analyzed the round of plans released between 2019, May 2019 and early 2020, taking a look at each of these plans preferred alternatives. And what we found is that these plans would have failed to conserve lands that the BLM's own research deemed worthy of protection. Uh, the plans would have removed decades old safeguards and left only a fraction of the areas preserved while opening vast swaths to energy and mineral development. Um, we specifically looked at areas of critical environmental concern or ACECs. Um, ACECs are a conservation tool that highlight areas where special management is needed to protect important historical, cultural and scenic values, uh, fish and wildlife values or other natural resources. And while BLM's interdisciplinary teams analyzed and determined that dozens of ACECs met their relevance and importance criteria, these areas were not included in the agency preferred alternatives. The agency under Trump instead was proposing to eliminate 94% of existing ACECs and proposing to protect only 2.1% of ACECs that uh, were found by the agency to meet that relevance and importance criteria. Uh, we also found that these kinds of rollbacks were an outlier. Uh, we looked back across presidential administrations and found that every presidential administration has added ACECs. And you can see here that the George W. Bush's administration added the most. And then actually, if you can just go back one slide here, because in addition to ACECs, we also looked at lands that were identified by BLM as containing wilderness characteristics, which is um, another value that the agency is, is required to inventory for. And we found that less than 1% of those lands, you know, again, that BLM themselves identified were included to be protected within agency preferred alternatives. So largely these trends favor development, particularly oil and gas development and strayed far from what could be considered balanced plans. Uh, and actually one more, please. So uh, now looking ahead, um, there are still a number of these resource management plans that are ongoing and that were not finalized under the last administration. And these ongoing resource management plans present the Biden administration with a real opportunity to improve conservation. And the way that they can do that is to reassess these plans to ensure that as they move forward, they can achieve a better balance. And you know, I think it's worth noting that in nearly all of these ongoing resource management plans, there is adequate analysis within the range of alternatives for the new administration to bring together a more balanced final plan. So I'll just take the, the remaining few minutes here to um, highlight some bigger picture conservation opportunities for the current administration. Um, first is related to the administration's priority of protecting 30% of, of our lands by 2030 and really using this goal as a general frame for improving conservation in the BLM realm. Um, you know, as has been said here, um, BLM is the largest land manager in the nation with over 245 million surface acres in their jurisdiction. And so, um, you know, BLM lands are really a vital piece of achieving 30 by 30. Um, and one of the other conservation opportunities that the Biden administration has is to revive section 202 of the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. And this would once again enable BLM to establish wilderness study areas. Um, wilderness study areas are deserving intact and wild lands. We often think of them as sort of the crown jewels of the BLM domain. Um, and wilderness study areas come with um, BLM's non-impairment management guidelines. And these guidelines set forth durable conservation, which can allow uh, wilderness study areas to be protected into the future, and also would allow them to count toward our nation's 30 by 30 goals. So finally, um, there is a conservation opportunity related to those areas of critical environmental concern that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, while BLM's authority to designate ACECs is clearly spelled out in the Federal Land Policy the Policy and Management Act, um, there's no minimum management standards for ACECs. And so the opportunity here is for BLM to set forth a rulemaking to develop minimum management standards for ACECs to you know, ensure that these lands are protected in a meaningful and durable way. And again, that would allow these special places to count toward our nation's 30 by 30 goals. 
So I'll just, I'll wrap up here and just uh, recap these conservation opportunities for the new administration. So first is to reassess ongoing resource management plans to ensure more balanced outcomes. Second is to look to 30 by 30 as a general frame to improve conservation in the BLM realm. Um, third is to revive BLM's authority under Section 202 of FLTMA to establish new wilderness study areas. And then finally, to create minimum management standards for ACECs to ensure that they can be, uh, they can also be part of our nation achieving 30 by 30. Great. Um, now we have a chance for some questions and I see some people have already started um, submitting some questions, which we'll get to in a few minutes after the presentations are done. Um, I guess I'll start with um, Chandra and your um, surveys on morale. One thing that we saw um, and that's come up a lot in my reporting is how um, the Trump administration's decision to relocate BLM headquarters um, and also disperse staff at how that has impacted and possibly caused and contributed to some of this poor morale. Um, I think there was some reporting showing upwards of uh, 80% of employees actually chose not to relocate. So I wondered how much you think that decision to relocate, how that has affected BLM's performance and what might be done about that. The move from DC to Colorado was incredibly disruptive to the agency and that was the intent. Um, and I heard a great analogy from a headquarters employee that I'd like to share that the move to Grand Junction was like a shipwreck for the agency. Employees were scattered across the ocean onto little islands. And now they're just starting to dry off and figure out who survived, who didn't, and how they're gonna communicate with each other. People uprooted their families and their lives and um, it's gonna take a lot of time to repair this damage. Um, I think opening up an office in DC is, is essential. Um, but again, there's employees, not just in Colorado, but all across the West. And just to follow up on that, um, one thing that came up in, in my reporting on this relocation is how the Trump administration has also, also took aim at environmental staff for BLM. So if um, you could talk a bit about how the Trump administration has, um, I guess what, what specific targeting there was for the environmental enforcement at BLM. So I guess I'm not sure what your question is, the uh, enforcement, the law enforcement officers or? Uh, um, environmental specialists and looking at impacts of public lands on environment and conservation. Um, so I think that, um, I get, <laughs> So your question is, are the, um, how can they in, enforce the laws on environmental, the environmental laws on the land? Um, yeah, if you could flesh out a bit just the um, past administration's impacts on environmental priorities at BLM. Yeah, I think that, um, uh, so by disabling and dismantling NEPA, that was a huge, had a huge impact on how environmental laws are enforced. And by cutting out a lot of the different uh, sectors of the public for um, uh, decision making and, and thinking about input and moving a lot of the decision making to headquarters away from the field staff and the state offices. Um, so uh, traditionally, a lot of decisions that were made at local level were moved to make, be made only at headquarters. Um, thank you. Yeah, let's um, bring Laurel into this discussion. Um, you talked a bit about the changes throughout administrations. Um, and I wondered, looking at your recommendations um, for reforms, um, what can the Biden administration do um, to, I guess, ensure we don't continue to see this ping-ponging of policy from administration to administration? I guess what, what um, what actions can the Biden administration take or perhaps Congress to ensure some continuity? Right. Yeah. As you, know, as you mentioned, it, it's not unusual to see policy and priority shifts from administration to administration. And, you know, one thing I think that can be done to provide some continuity uh, between administrations is these resource management plan um, revisions. You know, these 
the, the resource management plans will be in effect for 20 plus years. Um, they will certainly span uh, multiple administrations. And so um, really, uh, you know, making sure that these are done right, that they're done in a balanced way um, it is crucial because they will last for, for so long. And so, you know, again, the, the Biden administration has a real opportunity here with um, all of those plans that were not, uh, not completed during the last administration. Um, so that's one piece. And then, um, you know, additionally, the, the, the rulemaking that we mentioned, um, rulemaking can also span um, administrations and can really set forth some, um, some more continuity to allow for um, additional tools for BLM to uh, bring forward conservation. Um, and do you see any opportunity for bipartisan consensus here or um, action by Congress? You know, that's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, typically conservation has been bipartisan. Um, all the places that, you know, and we've talked about, you know, ACECs and, and wilderness study areas, but I think the important thing to remember is that um, these are all local places that are important to local people. And um, in many cases, uh, folks have been um, advocating for these places to be conserved uh, for decades or longer. So I do think that there's opportunity for um, bipartisan uh, conservation solutions here within the BLM realm. Chandra, do you agree? Yeah, I agree with Laurel. The, um, um, the disputes aren't going away, um, but polls do show that Americans publicly support climate solutions. Um, and hopefully we'll see this translated into the type of bipartisan political support, support that's necessary to guarantee success. But it's gonna take um, a political commitment. Great, I, with that, um, we'll move on to the rest of our presentations um, before digging in more for audience questions as well. So um, Richard Spots, um, we're on to your presentation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Spots. Uh, before I took early retirement, I uh, was the planning and environmental coordinator for the Arizona Strip District Office of the Bureau of Land Management, uh, located in St. George, Utah, uh, from 2002 to 2017. And basically, my, most of my job was overseeing and coordinating the NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act compliance, for a district with three units uh, that included two national monuments and a, a public domain area, basically all the BLM land north and west of the Colorado River in the state of Arizona. And um, unfortunately, I learned during my 15 years at BLM that the dominant management culture plays an enormous role in whether or how various laws and scientific data are used in making decisions. And frankly, based on my experience, at least in a pretty rural uh, setting and office, uh, the, the dominant BLM management culture was corrupt, regressive, biased, and secretive. And that included throughout the eight years of the previous Obama administration. Uh, I received external threats from Clive and Bundy supporters uh, in my role as NEPA coordinator. And I also received internal threats from managers uh, for trying to do my job and for trying to keep me from documenting uh, concerns in writing and basically to do my job. Uh, at one point, I filed a whistleblower complaint on uh, the Bundy trespass grazing issue. Uh, prior to the 2014 infamous Bunkerville standoff that almost led to a you know, violent uh, situation. And I tried to get BLM to focus on solutions that worked for a previous clump trespass grazing um, in terms of losing or using, excuse me, uh, contempt uh, citations from judges, bench warrants for arrests, civil liens and forfeitures, and more targeted limited roundups um, as, as less provocative potential remedies, but my recommendations were ignored. My whistleblower complaint was mishandled 
And we'll never know, but if some of my recommendations had been taken seriously, perhaps the Bunkerville standoff would not have occurred which might have prevented the Malheur refuge occupation, which might have reduced the steam for the January 6th uh, Capitol attempted insurrection. Um, so it's really important that people understand how the management culture and how allowing privilege, mostly white men to get away with whatever they want uh, has contributed to a lot of the management problems in the West. Um, now it's also important to realize when we're talking about 30 by 30, protection of lands. Uh, the protection in law and in designations um, sometimes can just be words on paper if it's not effectively implemented and enforced out on the ground. Um, these laws and these designations are not self-implementing. They're not self-enforcing. Red-blooded humans, federal officials and employees are responsible for fulfilling the expectations and the intent of those laws and those protective designations. So never assume that when you think you've achieved a protection victory in law or an RP designation, that it's necessarily being adequately implemented out on the ground. Um, and so a lot more monitoring, I believe, is necessary. And too often groups just claim victories and then tend to walk away and focus on the next victory over the horizon without necessarily monitoring to make sure that their previous victory is stuck in terms of effective implementation. Uh, now, overall, the resource trends in the West on BLM lands and elsewhere are rapidly declining. Uh, good examples for that are uh, decreasing populations of sage grouse in the Great Basin. And I would argue uh, rapid declines in Mojave and Sonoran desert tortoises in the Southwest. Um, BLM has not stopped these downward spirals. And to me, that's the bottom line. Um, if BLM is going to be effective at addressing the climate and extinction crises, um, they're going to have to have a lot stronger reform, cultural reform, um, and ultimately be measured by whether they can stop the downward trends and reverse them. Um, now, uh, you can see my six recommendations here for reforming BLM, and I won't get into them in, in great detail because I see I'm about out of time. But bottom line is to the best of their ability, the new Biden leaders need to remove the Trump appointees, not recycle ineffective Obama appointees, modify performance evaluations, uh, require independent audits like IRS audits of some uh, random management decisions, uh, holding managers accountable, uh, require continuing education for managers and fundamentally reform the whistleblower process. Those are some basic recommendations that I'm hopeful the Biden administration uh, will implement. Um, so uh, thank you very much for your consideration. And now we will hear from Mary Jo. Thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Mary Jo Rudwell, and I worked for the Bureau of Land Management for over 35 years in five different locations throughout the country, performing a variety of different jobs during that time. Uh, I want to say from the outset that I have the utmost respect for the organization, its mission, and its people. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, it's tough duty. I retired in August 2019 as BLM Wyoming's state director. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, the Bureau of Land Management's mandate is multiple use and sustained yield. This mandate is outlined in our Organic Act which is the Federal Land Policy and Management Act of 1976. While conservation is absolutely a valid part of that mission, there are also many other facets to the mission as defined in that law. It's important to remember that the Bureau of Land Management, Management's mission is very different from the mission of other interior agencies like the National Park Service. I'm gonna very briefly elaborate on the recommendations shown on this slide that I have uh, that I would love to give the Biden administration if I were given the opportunity. 
The first one is to protect apolitical civil service, especially uh, senior executives. The existence of apolitical career employees is crucial if you're going to have a properly functioning federal government. In the last eight years, employees at all levels of the government have been targeted in various ways. In 2017, the Department of the Interior moved over 50 executives to different agencies and different jobs. They also did this later in the administration. I believe it was done as a shot across the bow, if you will, to make sure that top leadership was more concerned about whether they would have a job tomorrow than possibly making the best decision for their unit. Um, I think that's not a good thing to do to, to people. The second point is communicate with employees at all levels of the organization. As we all know, two-way communication is vital in any healthy organization. In particularly the last four years, very little information was sought from employees and very little information was shared, even at the executive level. There were many examples of times that we would find out about things, decisions and events by reading about them in publications like e, &E News. Clearly that's not a good way to run an organization. The next point, trust but verify, hold employees accountable. It's really obvious that experience, expertise, and the opinions of career employees at all levels was not held in very high esteem in the past. Employees have to feel that they are listened to and valued. We are very adept at adapting, and we will honor the direction we're given as we know that we're part of the executive branch, and that's our job. The next point, which has been covered, but I think uh, really should be emphasized. We need to restore a better national office to the Washington DC area. The move of the Bureau of Land Management's national office to Grand Junction, Colorado was a thinly veiled effort to gut the organization. With no national leadership inside the Beltway, the Bureau of Land Management will never be able to compete with and coordinate well with other organizations. I'm not advocating putting the same structure in that was previously in place. There were a lot of things about it that were not efficient, but creating a more efficient Washington office would be a great opportunity to honor President Biden's Build Back Better initiative. The next point, honor the delegation of authority. Decisions need to be made at the appropriate level of an organization. There's no need to usurp decision-making to the departmental level or to the national office level, as long as BLM leadership is given clear direction and they're held accountable to perform the tasks as they're given. The next point, amend the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. The Bureau of Land Manage Management's mission is very broad and very vague. Unless FLIPMA is changed, Administrations can wreak havoc on the organization by implementing drastic changes of direction between administrations. This point was, was mentioned earlier in the broadcast. If the American people really want the Bureau of Land Management to operate different, differently than it does and than it has, this really needs to happen. The last point I would want, like to elaborate on is nominate a knowledgeable director candidate. The Bureau of Land Management is a very important organization. Not having permanent leadership in place is really inexcusable. This organization has not had a permanent Senate confirmed director in over four years. This must be a goal and an accomplishment of the Biden administration. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Thank you both for those presentations. Um, to get started here, um, Richard, you mentioned, you talked about your experience with the Bundys and we've seen um, this, we've seen how political extremism has spilled over into public lands debates um, the past decade more. And I um, were familiar with the Bundy occup occupation as an example of this and wondered what kind of recommendations you would have for um, the Biden administration and also BLM to deal with um, 
the use of this kind of political extremism and support BLM staff. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, first of all, it's important to understand that when it comes to law enforcement, including and especially with respect to the Clive and Bundy uh, chronic trespass grazing and lawlessness, that you really need strong cooperation from the Department of Justice. It's not just the Interior Department and BLM leadership, but it's also the US attorneys, the FBI, and the Justice Department leadership. And I think this in the past has been one of the breakdowns where I believe that the US attorney and the FBI badly mishandled the Bunkerville standoff prosecutions and subsequently the Malheur refuge occupation um, prosecutions. And that undermined the credibility of law enforcement and emboldened the lawbreakers as we saw January 6th at the uh, Capitol attempted insurrection. Um, I have recommended for years and years and have not seen any evidence that it's been done that they look at using the clump strategy that was successful for Arizona trespass grazing, a similar character to Clive and Bundy of using arrest uh, bench warrants for contempt of court for violating existing court orders to put uh, Mr. Bundy in jail until the trespass cows are removed to use civil forfeitures and liens, including of the trespass cattle that go to auction, to take the profit motive out of the trespass and to consider more stealthy, limited targeted roundups of the cows during the hot months around waters with surveillance, without advance notice, so that you don't get into confrontational or dangerous situations. Those are the kinds of obvious low hanging fruit remedies that as far as I know, the Justice Department and the Interior Department have never pursued. And it's totally appalling that we're, that, so we need better law enforcement as well as a more courageous and effective land management. Thank you. And Mary Jo, I um, wanted to get you in on this discussion, your thoughts on that question. Well, for some reason, I can't get my video to come back. Uh, can you still hear me though? Becca? Uh, yeah, we can. Okay, let me let me give it a shot here. It's, all right, there we go. Um, I have very personal and very painful experience in this, <laughs> in this regard. Um, I was the Southern Nevada District Manager uh, from 2008 to 2012. And in 2012, we had spent uh, probably two years planning um, to um, do the gather of the cattle that were illegally grazing uh, in Southern Nevada at the time. Um, unfortunately, uh, the day that we were getting ready to go out and set up our command post, uh, we were sent a message from our leadership in Washington that we were to stand down, that we were not to proceed with the operation. Um, Richard is absolutely right that in order for something like this to be successful, you have to have a large um, interdisciplinary, interagency effort uh, to resolve something as complex as the Bundy trespass is. Um, and unfortunately in 2012, many of the organizations that had agreed to help us uh, had at the 11th hour changed their mind uh, for one reason or another. Um, and they backed away from providing us the support that we needed. And I believe that that's probably the primary reason uh, that the 2012 operation was called off. Um, I never had the opportunity to see that thing, um, see that operation through uh, because of the fact that um, I took another job uh, a few months later um, and I was not there when they attempted uh, to do the roundup in 2014. Um, and as we all know, there were, uh, it did not go well. And I think there were a, a variety of reasons uh, that that happened. Um, but not having support from the Department of Justice and the FBI um, and state agencies and local law enforcement, um, if you don't have all of those people working with you, uh, it's going to be incredibly difficult to be able to resolve that very complex problem. Thank you. And um, my last question before we turn over to um, the 
audience questions that people have been putting into the Q&A. Um, I wondered, and, and we could start with Mary Jo for this, how big of a challenge you think it will be for the Biden administration to get BLM employees on board with his administration's priorities? As we've talked about, BLM is a large um, agency that's spread across the country. Um, and what kind of conflicts or, or challenges there would be um, to enforcing, to um, achieving these goals around environmental conservation and climate change? Rebecca, I think, I think it's a great question. I don't, I really don't think that the administration is going to have a problem in getting Bureau of Land Management employees to back um, a lot of the things that they have in mind. Um, I think the key here is for employees to be talked to and listened to, and then to give them clear direction in terms of what your goals are. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the communication was very poor in the last four years. And uh, unfortunately, in I would say the last four years of the Obama administration as well. And so um, being able to, um, to have that really effective communication um, and to work to hold people accountable, I really think employees will get on board if they know what's expected of them, and if they're shown that they're being listened to and they're being respected. I don't think that that is gonna be a problem for this administration if, that's, if that is the situation. And um, Richard, I, if you have additional thoughts on that, I'd love to get that, but it also really segues well into one of our audience questions. Um, we're gonna to get to a lot more topics like um, questions on the 30 by 30 goals, um, and um, how to improve transparency at the BLM. But um, one question we got was about um, prioritization from the Biden administration, how much attention the administration seems to be putting directly on BLM and, and these kinds of reforms. Um, so maybe you could um, comment on what you've seen so far and, and how much hope this gives you that um, this will be a priority or could be a priority for the administration. Is that for me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so far, I'm very encouraged, um, both by the historic long overdue nomination of Deb Holland to be the Interior Secretary, um, because I think sh she has a very impressive eclectic background and good strong record on conservation and land protection. Um, and the fact that some of the knuckle-dragger Republicans in the Senate don't like her uh, also confirms that she's probably a very wise uh, choice. I was also very pleased to learn that Nada Culver has been nominated to be the BLM Deputy Director for Policies and Programs um, because I've worked with Nada in the past and I think she has a very strong uh, background on BLM issues. And I think she could bring a refreshing change in terms of contributing to BLM leadership going forward. Uh, but the one thing I really want to say is that for all the people commendably working the last four years to try to stop, delay, reverse, rescind all of the horrible decisions and actions of the Trump administration and former Interior Secretary Bernhardt and former Acting BLM Director Penley, that I urge all of you to put the same or greater effort into supporting the positive changes that the Biden administration is trying to achieve as evidenced by the initial, initial round of executive orders and interior secretarial orders, which I've all read and which are very positive. So again, just as you worked hard to stop weakening and going backwards on public land conservation, Please have the same or greater efforts to support the Biden administration, including to help Congress be more supportive in terms of reforming FLIPMA, uh, supporting the uh, improvements to the RMP process, more conservation, ACECs, wilderness study areas, and more funding. But be sure that if you increase BLM's capacity for management, that it's linked to achieving those cultural reforms. 
because I believe that if we don't get the management cultural reforms, we're not gonna get the bang for our buck out of any increased staffing and funding. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so there were a number of questions on the 30 by 30 conservation goals of the Biden administration. So um, I guess to kind of group those together um, and this could go for, I think any one number of our experts to answer um, is, um, is what, what counts towards the 30 by 30 goals. Um, some questions noted a distinction between preserve, um, sorry, protect and conserve um, lands and whether that actually matters in, in trying to achieve those ambitious goals. Um, and a second more specific question was how um, livestock grazing factors in and whether um, those goals would consider the harmful ecological impacts of livestock grazing, how that would influence those 30 by 30 goals. Um, so uh, I think that we can direct that question um, perhaps to Laurel, if that works for you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, um, folks, folks in the audience and Rebecca. Um, you know, I'll, I think I'll just start and say that there, um, th this is really probably the crux of 30 by 30 is really trying to determine um, what sort of conservation tools um, in the BLM toolbox can can be brought forward to achieve these goals. Um, you know, I mentioned a couple of them, um, but those are certainly not the only ones. And um, I, I did see some other comments in the in the chat box about things like wildlife corridors. Um, you know, others that we didn't really talk about here today, but um, but really probably should be considered too are things like wild and scenic rivers, and um, and there are likely others as well. So. Um, you know, I think what's important is uh, is really ensuring that BLM has this really full suite of options as as they move forward and consider um, what should be counted toward those 30 by 30 goals. And um, I wondered if, is there anyone else who wants to jump in on that before we move on? I'd like to, if, if I could, for just a second. Um, I think it's really important to understand that livestock grazing is another valid uh, part of the Bureau of Land Management's mission. But livestock grazing needs to be properly managed livestock grazing and done properly and done in the right places. And it absolutely can happen. I've seen it happen. Um, it, is, it can be a really um, contentious program at times, but at the end of the day, uh, many ranchers are, are very good conservationists. And I think we need to be very careful to make sure that we don't, um, you know, we don't discount a valid use of the public lands uh, that's been going on for years, particularly if we ensure that it's done properly. Uh, it's it's an important valid use, but as I as I pointed out, it has to be properly managed and done in the the appropriate places. Um, great. Well, um, we okay. So. Um, yeah, we got questions on a lot of topics. I, one area that's come up a lot is oil and gas extraction. So we'd love to dig into that further. Um, so this is um, two different questions that I'll group together. Um, one is a hypothetical of how much of a problem would it be if oil and gas were taken out of the mix? Um, and the second question was why, um, why don't we replace oil and gas extraction on BLM lands with renewable energy sources like wind and solar farms? Um, and then um, it, uh, yeah, so I, I um, let's, let's kind of talk about those kinds of pop hypotheticals, what um, the panelists think on that. Um, and if, um, I think um, maybe this is a question for Richard or if someone else would like to jump in on that. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Does I guess um, just looking yeah, at oil and gas it, extraction, if you right could talk in, in about terms that. of in terms of oil and gas, I think it's obvious to anybody who's following the science um, that we need to rapidly transition away from fossil fuels and burning them, and toward uh, clean renewable energy sources like solar, wind, tidal, geothermal, uh, etc. 
And in some cases, BLM under FLIPMA, under existing law, uh, has discretionary authority uh, about oil and gas related decisions. But it's important though to know that the framework and the limits on that discretion ultimately are from Congress in terms of the statutory framework. So there's some improvement that can and should occur with how BLM applies its discretionary authority to limit, restrict oil and gas and coal development on BLM lands. But ultimately, uh, my guess is that Congress is also going to have to enact some federal laws and reform FLIPMA um, to do that. And speaking of reform, I'd just like to tag on uh, to Mary Jo's comments on grazing, which I agreed with, but to point out that among the FLIPMA reforms that could occur would be to raise uh, BLM grazing fees to fair market value to stop an outrageous taxpayer subsidy of grazing administration on BLM lands. And second, to allow willing seller acquisition of grazing permits uh, for their retirement. If Congress allowed those two reforms, raising grazing fees to fair market levels comparable to state and private lands and allowing willing sellers uh, to, you know, to transfer grazing permits for permanent retirement, those would be very valuable, I believe, to uh, advancing conservation. Thank you. Thank you. Chandra, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I would like to comment a little bit about the oil and gas system um, and the approach that's taken um, on BLM lands. I think that the system right now is fundamentally broken. I think there's um, there's a series of legislative reforms that are being considered um, and by, by different um, uh, members of the legislature that I think are, are really important to, to consider. Um, but I also, um, right now, renewables are part of the, the multiple use mandate and we see solar farms um, popping up as um, um, on public lands. And I think we need to be cautious with that also. I think, um, you know, with renewables, you still get those same spider web of roads across open spaces and they do have impacts to uh, local areas. So um, I just, um, I think it's better if things move slowly. And I think it's better if um, we get the chance to plan um, and have a lot of public and stakeholders involved in those, in those, um, those planning decisions. Rebecca, can I jump in too? <laughs> Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Question. Uh, no, Sh Chandra makes a great point. Um, you know, there's a lot of renewable energy on public lands, but it is not without impacts. Um, it has to be carefully planned and carefully executed in order to um, to not have uh, significant impacts. Um, I do think that I agree absolutely that um, we all would like to see transitioning away from fossil fuels and, and toward uh, cleaner energy. Um, I do think again that oil and gas drilling is, is right now a, a valid mission, part of the BLM's mission. Um, but what happened in the last few years is not really the way we should be managing it. Um, it has to be done very thoughtfully, very carefully. And, and one of the things that's important to point out is that land use planning is how you figure out where it's appropriate to do those sorts of things. And if we have good balanced land use plans in place, um, some development can occur and be done in a way that, uh, that it's not going to be damaging to the environment and to, uh, to the species that rely on those habitats. Thank you. Um, I think um, this time really flew, so I think we're gonna start wrapping things up. Um, we have time for one more question. And this one, um, since we've talked a lot about internal BLM struggles, um, I wanted to also talk about public engagement. Um, what, what would, um, and this is something I think everyone could weigh in on briefly, is what can be done to improve the public's understanding of the importance of BLM um, and their public lands when so much attention is given to um, other parts of interior like national parks and the park service, what can be done to engage the public to focus attention on BLM? And um, I think 
Um, I guess we'll just start um, down the list. I'm sure um, everyone here has ideas on that. So um, Chandra, would you like to kick that off? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, I think you're right that it is uh, one of the the a lot of uh, the public doesn't realize when they are on BLM's BLM lands that they're not on uh, Park Service lands or Forest Service lands. Um, and so I do think like a giant campaign um, promoting awareness. I had uh, an employee um, recommend that the Job Corps um, um, be assigned to BLM offices. Um, right now, there are volunteers in um, different communities that do things like um, uh, work on trash pickups, and um, and I think that it there are there are some positive use to volunteers. Um, I know that in some places they've had um, uh, volunteer archaeologists helping with some of the work that's going on. So I think anything that can be done to just increase public engagement and recognizing that that there's a lot of different stakeholders um, rather than those that are just uh, traditionally recognized at a lot of the field offices. Those are really interesting. I, I find the idea of assigning the courts to the courts to BLM really fascinating. Um, do we have any other ideas from the panelists on engaging the public? Richard? Yeah, I think one important tool uh, that maybe has been utilized well for national parks and some national wildlife refuges, but not so much for BLM, are friends groups, local friends groups. I know there are some and they've been very effective for some of the national monuments like Grand Staircase Escalante uh, in Utah and Gold Butte in Nevada. Um, and it's really good if you can have a local friends group uh, to kind of help maintain the visibility of BLM conservation issues, to help monitor uh, the NEPA coming out of those offices, uh, to make sure that the managers are following the law, not trying to get around it. Um, and so I think part of it is not only kind of increasing public awareness, but more on the ground or local vigilance of conservation minded people. Um, I, I think that'll be an, an important component going forward. Thank you. And Laurel, sounds like you want to go ahead. Sure. Well, and thanks. I think, you know, what Chandra and Richard have mentioned, there are great ideas. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I have the opportunity to work with folks um, all around the country who are, are doing exactly this and working really hard in, uh, in spotlighting local BLM lands. Um, and so, you know, continuing to tell those stories about the important local places and why um, they need to be conserved and protected, um, I think is another way to really um, help spotlight the BLM. Thanks. Great, and um, Mary Jo, did you wanna finish us off and? Um, sure, I, I think that's, that? yeah, that's a million dollar question. You know, when you have an organization that's responsible for so many millions of acres um, and has such a limited capacity uh, to do that work, um, I think having friends groups and having volunteers help is, is incredibly important uh, because obviously we couldn't do the job without them. Um, but getting the word out about how great the BLM really is in terms of all the wonderful uh, areas that we are tasked to manage. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out even after <laughs> working for BLM as many years as I did. Um, we're a lot better at uh, just trying to get the job done than we are uh, advertising uh, what a great uh, what a great thing public lands are. So, um, I, I don't have, I don't have the best idea of how to, how to make that happen, but, uh, I think some of the ideas expressed by the other panelists have been very good. It's certainly not an issue that can be addressed overnight. Um, as many of these are that we've talked about today. Um, thank you so much to peer and peak environment show for, um, for, um, organizing this today and so many thoughtful questions. Uh, and detailed questions from the audience to our panelists. This was a great um, discussion. So appreciate the opportunity.
Great. Thank you so much, Lee, Rebecca, for your work and um, for your um, help moderating this panel. And I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, we'll go through all of the Q&A and see what we can figure out. And again, we have our report coming out next week. We'll send you guys all a link and uh, ho hopefully we'll hear from you again. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.